everyone, I'm Brooke Siegel, representing Pacific Wildlife Care in Morro Bay, California. Pacific Wildlife Care is the premier resource for rescuing, rehabilitating, and releasing wildlife back into the wild once they are recovered. We are the only rehabilitation facility in San Luis Obispo that does this. And we also provide important information, a conservation outreach to help people coexist with wildlife peacefully. So if you ever see a wild animal that seems injured, sick, or orphaned, please call our wildlife hotline at area code 805-543-WILD. So I wanted to welcome you to our first virtual Wild at Heart at Home event. This is day one, and I am so excited to talk to you about songbirds. Songbirds, they're known as passerines, which is defined as perching birds. At Pacific Wildlife Care, I work in the baby bird room as a baby bird rehabilitation technician. The baby bird program is an area of the clinic where we can specialize in the care of baby songbirds. Songbirds um, take up a lot of our intakes. Birds in general amount to 76% of our intakes. That's including all types of birds. Um, but since we're not finished with the year 2020, I'm going to be referring to 2016 or 2019 when we received, we received 619 songbirds of over 61 species. Among the most common intakes of songbirds were house finches, house sparrows, northern mockingbirds, cliff swallows, California towhees, Anna's hummingbirds, European starlings, American crows, California scrub jays, and many more. We receive so many different species that require particular diets and specialized husbandry, including how we keep them housed in their enclosures and their pre-release flight cages. We have to think of their nat the natural history of each species and we have to consider how they forage, whether they are ground feeders or if they feed in the canopy of the trees. Do they hunt their insects on the wing? Do they need live crickets daily to hunt? And they need it, whether they need extra enrichment in the case of corvids and scrub jays and magpies and ravens. All of this is so important that it is well researched and executed by our staff and our volunteers. We give each patient the best standard of medical care once they enter the clinic, and we also provide the highest standard of continued care, which for a baby songbird looks like feeding them as much as every 15 minutes when they're hatchlings to every 30 or 45 minutes and then hourly and less as they are older fledglings. The constant demands of feeding baby birds requires volunteers who have specialized knowledge and skills to tend to them quickly and cleanly. For example, you don't wanna spill any diet on a baby bird while feeding them because it affects the function of their feathers, which must remain perfect for thermoregulation. Another thing to consider is where their trachea leading, their glottis leading to the trachea is so that you don't aim for that and instead you aim for the esophagus when you're orally hydrating them or giving them a liquid diet. Many things have changed this year, but the vulnerability of wildlife that has been displaced by events as common as falling from a nest or being a, caught by a cat or a dog or illegal tree trimming, those issues remain the same. And so they need our help more than ever. And, and if anything, the numbers of patients have increased during this time. And so I thank you for listening in and giving your support. And following this presentation, we're going to be selling raffle tickets for a chance to win amazing prizes every day.
And now I'd like to introduce you to a non-releasable ambassador, Corax, and Claudia and Karen, who will be presenting him. Hello and welcome. My name is Claudia, and this is Karen, who trains our birds and handlers and has agreed to help me out today, and Corax, our common raven. We're all members of the Pacific Wildlife Care Education Team. In this video, I'm going to talk about Corax in particular and common ravens in general. The name Corax comes from the scientific name for common ravens, which is Corvus Corax. Corax came to us in 2012 when his nest fell out of a tree in San Miguel. Raven nests um, can be in trees, on ledges, on buildings, and they're quite impressive. They can be five feet across. They're made out of entwined um, branches and sticks, and they have an inner lining of grass, and often the bottom has um, lamb's wool or some other animal fur in it. The nestlings have red mouths and blue eyes, which they lose during the first year of their life. Corax is a small raven. He weighs about two pounds, and ravens can get over four pounds. Uh, we know that he is a male because we had him tested. We had his DNA tested. You can't tell the difference between a male and a female raven. And their size seems to be dependent on their, the latitude where they live. The further north you go and the colder it gets, the bigger ravens tend to be. <clears throat> there were three nestlings in the nest that fell. Two of them sadly were dead, and Corax was the one remaining alive. He had injuries which eventually healed, but it was soon realized that he could not fly as well as he needed to to survive in the wild, so we decided to make him an education bird. The range of ravens is enormous. They basically inhabit the entire northern hemisphere. Um, ravens are so adaptable and resourceful that they can live in many different um, habitats. They live in the tundra and deserts and forests and, um, and do quite well in extremes of temperature. Also, their diet is so variable that that makes it easy for them to live in different habitats. Um, they're omnivores and they will eat really just about anything. Um, they eat roadkill, they eat small uh, birds and mammals, and fruits and vegetables and nuts, and um, sometimes they steal salmon from eagles. Um, Corax, on a daily basis, he usually gets a couple of frozen mice and then maybe some scrambled eggs and some dry cat food and whatever fruits and vegetables are available. And he loves nuts, so he always gets a peanut and a Brazil nut. <clears throat> if um, the nest had not fallen, the three chicks would have spent about six weeks in the nest, and then they would have started experimenting um, flying. By the time they are ready to fly, they're the size of the parents, and they've got all their feathers. And then they will stay, even after flying, they will stay under the parents' care for about two months, at which point the parents will chase them out and expect them to find their own territory and their own mate. Corax has just completed a molt. Um, ravens go through a complete molt once a year and they replace all their feathers. And um, the reason it takes so long is that ravens like raptors lose their flight feathers, which includes their tail feathers, and there are about 50 of them all together on a raven. And they lose them only two at a time and they don't lose a second pair until the first pair has come in all the way. So that takes about a week. And you can see how with 50 feathers, that would take a long time for a molt. Ravens um, live in the wild about 10 to 15 years on average. There are some uh, band returns where ravens have lived into the early 20s. Um, and in captivity, they can live twice that long. So 40 to 50 years. <clears throat> so when the juveniles are chased out by the parents, they often form groups and stay together, um, honing their flying skills and their foraging skills. And then eventually they will pair up with a mate and find their own territory to defend. And ravens don't migrate. 
and they mate for life. So once they settle in with their mate, that's where they're probably going to be for the rest of their lives. People often wonder what the difference is between ravens and crows. And so I'm going to use Corax to demonstrate some of those differences. Um, the first is size, which I can't demonstrate because I don't have a friendly crow to compare his size with, but he's about twice the size of a crow. And the larger ravens, of course, there'd be a bigger um, difference in size. Um, their beak is different. Ravens have a much heavier beak than crows do. And he also has feathers under his chin that um, are specialized. They're, they're long and pointed, and they can give him a very shaggy look if he um, puffs them up. He also has feathers on his thighs and on the top of his head that he can um, puff up and control. So he can raise the feathers on the top of his head. Um, he can just raise the ones over his ears so he looks like he has horns. And he can raise all of them so he's got this puffy head. And ravens use these um, feathers that they can control to communicate with other ravens. And um, they can appear bigger and more dominating. Um, using these feathers. When they, when they puff up the feathers on their legs, they actually look like they're wearing pants. The tail shape is different um, between ravens and crows. So if you look at Corax's tail, um, the, the middle two feathers on his tail are longer than the side feathers. And so his tail has the shape of a wedge or a diamond, where a crow's, all the, the tail feathers are the same length. And so it's just straight across on the bottom. And when the birds are flying, sometimes you can distinguish a raven from a crow just based on the tail, the shape of the tail. Um, their voices are different. Uh, ravens have a much deeper kind of a croak uh, compared to the crow's familiar caw. Um, all of the corvids, so that includes the ravens, the jays, the crows, and the nutcrackers, can mimic other animals, other, um, they can mimic the sound of machines and the sounds of people. And Corax actually does talk. He doesn't talk on command, so we probably won't hear him today, but he has, um, he started out saying, hi Corax, which is something I say to him every morning. So he was repeating what I was saying. And then once we learned he could mimic, we started teaching him additional phrases. And he learned about a dozen different phrases that he could say. And it, when they talk, it's very clear. Um, you can understand them perfectly, what they're saying. Uh, there have been there are stories of people being out in the wilderness away from any humans and hearing uh, human voices and um, songs and humming and the sound of chainsaws or the sound of car alarms. And when they've tracked it down to who's, where it's coming from, there's usually a raven at the end of, the, of that story. Ravens are fabulous flyers. They are masters of the air. Um, the first time I ever saw ravens was at a condor lookout, and I watched them circle with the, the golden eagles and the condors, um, catching thermals until they were just spots up in the sky that you could barely see. But they also um, dive. They make lightning turns. They do somersaults. They, um, they do barrel rolls. They, um, there's actually a a video of a raven flying upside down for about a half a mile. And um, they can even fly very briefly backwards like a hummingbird. So they're, they're just acrobats in the air and seem to, to love to fly. I was in Yellowstone um, a couple of springs ago and I watched a raven flying across the sky being harassed by a little bird. And the raven did this perfect barrel roll and with his wings hit the little bird and knocked him out of the way, he didn't seem to hurt the bird. And the raven never missed a beat, just um, did this barrel roll and kept flying, and it was quite magical to watch. You can't talk about ravens and crows um, without talking about intelligence, because in the last 20 or 30 years, there have just been dozens of studies done um, and experiments testing their intelligence, and each one seems to come up with um, greater and greater evidence of the intelligence of these birds. It's been shown that they, they can use tools, they um, can solve complex problems with multiple steps, um, and they recognize faces. That was a study done at the University of Washington where crows that were captured um, by someone wearing a Dick Cheney mask 
um, remembered that and not only remembered that person, the seven crows that were captured, but they spread the word to their offspring and to other crows so that, um, that, that if you're wearing that Cheney mask, you get harassed. And it's been going on for years. So if you are mean to a raven or crow, be prepared to um, be harassed for a long time afterwards. Um, the most interesting study, I thought, was the one where they showed that ravens um, practice delayed gratification. So there's a famous study that used children where they offered them a single marshmallow now or, a, or two marshmallows later. And children always take the single marshmallow until they're about seven. Well, ravens, um, they didn't use marshmallows, but ravens do practice delayed gratification and they will give up um, a lesser value, give up a greater value tre treat initially because they know they'll get more later. And that's considered um, something that only fairly intelligent, in fact, I think it's limited to the apes and humans that will do that. So they couldn't figure out how a, an animal with a brain the size of a walnut could have such high intelligence. And even though ravens um, have the biggest brain among the birds in relation to their body size, it's still a tiny brain. And um, only recently have they discovered that the neurons that correlate with intelligence are packed so densely in a raven brain that it, they have four times the density of mammals. So that a raven in their brain has the same number of neurons as a monkey. And um, they have been referred to as flying monkeys, and uh, so that makes sense. So I'll just tell you a quick story about Corax. Um, I was going into his cage one day to pick up feathers because when he molts, it makes quite a mess with the feathers. And so I was um, going along picking up feathers and holding them in my hand to throw away later. And I realized that behind me, Corax was on the ground and he was also, he was picking up the feathers I was missing and carrying them in his beak. And I had never seen him pick up feathers before, so I think he was just imitating me. So although I knew that he could imitate my voice, I did not know that he could imitate my behavior. But that's what he apparently was doing. <clears throat> um, and the last thing I'll talk about is just that ravens play and science, scientists correlate play with intelligence. And ravens love to play. If you ever get a chance to observe them, they've been seen tumbling down, rolling down hills, tumbling in snow banks, sliding on um, icy roofs or on icy sidewalks. Um, they will uh, perch on a wire and fall forward and hang upside down, drop, come back up, and do it all over again. And um, they will fly together on windy days in large groups and play tag and pick up sticks and drop them, and play keep away, and do all of their acrobatics in the air together. So if you get a chance to observe ravens in this county, the best place to go is the Carrizo Plains. That's really where um, there's any large number of ravens. And so if you get the opportunity to just sit and observe ravens, I think you'll find that it's, it's enjoyable. Um, if you're interested in Pacific Wildlife Care, we have a Facebook page and we have a website. It's pacificwildlifecare.org. And on our website, there is information about what to do if you um, find an injured wild animal and uh, information about coming events and how you can volunteer or donate to Pacific Wildlife Care. So thank you very much. Thank you, Karen and Corax. And thank you for watching.